Mr. Pradeep Banavara on the call. He's one of the mentors for Hack. And uh, just a brief intro about Pradeep. Pradeep is uh, currently an architect at Aerospace Bike. Previous engagements, he's been with startups for a really long, long time. Uh, and I've uh, worked with him uh, in the past as well. Uh, so he was, uh, previous to this, he was heading engineering at an early stage startup, Epic One. And before that, he has, you know, as he says, he has failed at multiple startups. And we'll come back to this. And he's going to talk about this as well. He was also an ex-CTO at the Microsoft Accelerator here in Bangalore. So he has worked very closely with uh, multiple startups, not necessarily cybersecurity, but across the board, uh, and has had a deep look at uh, the various issues that, uh, you know, the various challenges that they face, various opportunities uh, possible here in Bangalore, in India, and uh, even outside. So he has a breadth of experience. <clears throat> Um, across backend mobile applications, deep learning. He's been looking at uh, machine learning and AI for a long, long time. And his specific areas of expertise are early stage startup product and technology, achieving product market fit uh, with a you know, keen eye on user experience design. So with that, I would like to welcome Pradeep and uh, uh, you know, request him to get it started. So we we are going to try to keep this uh, more interactive. So if you you know we do not have to wait till the end of the session for any Q and A. Uh, if you have if you have relevant questions during the uh, discussion, please feel free to uh, you know to either post the questions on the chat uh, or uh, interrupt if if it is necessary. All right. Uh, so, Abbas, uh, hopefully we have uh, the recording started as well. So, like always, we're going to record our sessions so that uh, people who haven't made it can come back later. All right. Thank you. So, thanks for joining, Pradeep. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, it is indeed uh, my pleasure to be here. And thank you to all the founders and uh, uh, others who have joined this call. Uh, it's a Sunday morning. I'm glad you all could make it. So let me just uh, start sharing my screen. Um, uh, let me know if you all can see my screen. Yeah, we can. Okay, um, so I have prepared a deck for for this talk and i'm going to briefly talk about these uh, fundamentally what challenges to early stage startup space uh, which is what i presume most of the startups are in uh, in this in this cohort so uh, before i start uh, is it okay if we spend like 5 minutes uh, just getting an introduction from everyone uh, rajiv had sent a, a brief of all the startups so if uh, the founders could just elicit at what stage they are in and uh, uh, if they have, what what are the primary challenges that they want to ad see addressed in this talk? That will be great. So if each founder uh, or a startup employee can spend a minute uh, to elicit these facts, we can get started. Is that cool? Yeah, I think I think that's a great idea. So maybe uh, we start from the top of the attendee list. I see uh, Abhishek Verma. Hi, Abhishek. Hi, Pradeep. Uh, this is Abhishek. I am part of a startup called Securely Share and uh, co-founded by Mr. Prakash Bhaskaran. Okay. And uh, I actually take care of uh, technologies, uh, integrations, deployments, uh, making solutions uh, work with custom-based, you know, solution architecting and all those stuff. So I was very keen to know how our Cyber security startup engineering challenges, building you know, top notch uh, security solutions would work out. So I have joined here. So I'll park that for Prakash, who can tell more about our you know journey as startup. Awesome. Thank you, Abhishek. 
Thank Hi, you. Pradeep. Uh, Prakash here. Uh, so just to add uh, what Abhishek uh, said, uh, we are in the data security, data privacy, data governance uh, space. Uh, we have a platform uh, with a rich set of APIs that can connect with uh, any uh, application and make them uh, data security aware and uh, privacy aware. Um, okay. Would love to uh, hear more from you as to what are the key components that we got to watch out while we are uh, building this out and rolling this out. Sure. Uh, do you have any like one top challenge that you face on a day to day basis that you want me to address here? Um, so our uh, top challenges, I think we are pretty good on the on the back end side, but uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, the UI UX on the application layer, um, you know we, we we are not all that uh, um, fluent. I uh, would love to see how you would go about doing it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Prakash. Thank you. All right, can we move on to Bhavan? Uh, hi, Pradeep. Uh, hi, Rajiv. Good morning. Uh, hi, Bhavan. Good morning. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called as uh, Project Solutions. Uh, we are in the space of uh, email security. And okay. uh, uh, we have a flagship product called as ProDMark. Uh, which is into DMARC analytics, which is a email authentication standard, which we help our customers adopt uh, through our pro DMARC standard, through our pro DMARC platform. Uh, we have a few other products uh, on um, employee training and awareness, uh, more on the simulation side of things. Uh, so uh, for us, uh, you know, the key challenge is again a bit of uh, UI. How do you make it? Uh, uh, you know, something which is more easier for customers to use and how do you make it more attractive? And two is uh, how do you scale um, without having to invest too much money on the cloud-based platforms? So uh, they become expensive uh, beyond a point if you have to add more resources, but how do you still manage uh, with the existing uh, resources that you have to optimize it the most. So, I mean, those two things I would want to understand if that's possible today. Cool. Sure. Thank you. We can talk about these things. Wonderful. All right. Um, Mr. Chetak from Cyberpact. Hi, Chetak. Good morning, everybody. This is, this is Chetak here. I hope I'm Hello. Alone. Yeah, you're alone. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, great. Uh, we are into a we are primarily a service-based firm. However, now we're getting into product-based as well. So, uh, with the product, ours is primarily into uh, source code validation kind of thing. An application product that we are uh, working on that is still in idea stage. Okay. That would be it from my side. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Chetak. All right, Dr. Dinesha from CyberSena. All right. Hello, Dr. Dinesha. Uh, I can't hear, we can't yeah. hear you. Yeah, 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 good morning. Yeah, myself, Dr. Dinesh uh, from CyberSena. Uh, uh, it's a nice, uh, nice meeting, uh, Karthik Banavar. So I am also from Banavar, uh, which is in Assam district. And what oh, is, nice. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice meeting you. And uh, uh, my challenge that I am facing in uh, Cyber Sena is uh, because I am giving forensic investigation report uh, to the crime department. And uh, uh, while I am uh, tracing out uh, some hackers footprint, for example, Instagram hacker or, Insta or fake Instagram creator or uh, social media creator, the time uh, to analyze the tool, uh, no, analyze the hacker footprint, that time I need some specialized software. Uh, the software, uh, what I know is some of open for, you know, like a uh, free and open source. And uh, I'm just uh, looking at the uh, different uh, software tools available and uh, using by you know the government or some uh, defense labs and all those things because i am basically from a drdo background defense background 
but a uh, few of the things we can't use so what is the you know procedure to use through government or maybe in a international software like israel and all they are providing great security uh, forensic repo services for that uh, which are the you know uh, how to collaborate with them that that uh, kind of you know you know challenge that i am facing i i need a help for collaboration with uh, some of the mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, cyber forensic laboratories uh, across the world that's what my need need and doubt also so i request uh, kartik banawar to help me out okay no worries and i'm not kartik i'm pradeep that's okay yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right uh, thanks man thanks dinesh uh, let's see yes, if we can address these aspects yes yes pradeep pradeep thank you pradeep yeah Sure. All right. Let's move, move on to Manjunath from iSecurity. Hi, Manjunath. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, uh, we. Are, uh, I'm from iSecurity. I think currently we do provide uh, consulting services like uh, penetration testing, API security, DevSecOps. Correct. And we. Uh, I have a plan to build in a product. I think like other members asked. i need to understand the uh, uh, current uh, challenges in particularly in you know uh, maintaining those infrastructure or how to build in you know a, a team you know who are uh, where i can build a product in next like instead of taking one or two years to build a product can can a product development can be happen in six months using this current agile methods correct particularly on development perspective i need to you know understand those concerns okay cool thank you Sounds good. Um, so we are uh, for people who are joining just now. We have uh, the mentor Pradeep, who is uh, essentially going around the room and uh, listening to all the startups where they are and what they are doing and what if they have any specific questions they would like addressed. So uh, Pradeep is going to try to address uh, some of these questions at a at a much higher level during his uh, presentation. Uh, but if there are uh, you know very pointed quest- pointed questions, then we can. You know, we can always uh, uh, have that surface later on as well, Pradeep, and uh, sure. after this talk as well. Yeah. Okay. So, should we get started? Uh, I think we are done with everyone, right? Sorry, I'm I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see what's no, happening no. on the Zoho screen. Yeah, no, no worries. I think there are a few more. So let's go. Okay. There are maybe three or four more. So let's go to Mr. Mohit from Foresight. Okay. Cool. Hi, Mohit. and maybe a quick yeah quick uh, description of where you are what your startup is up to and uh, any particular things you would like to talk about okay um maybe okay i'm not able you're not able to reach to mohit uh, so how about uh, miss nanda from dsec 360 Hi uh hello good morning i'm good nanda morning, here nanda. hi so uh no, nanda uh, what we are doing is that so can you give a you know one minute uh, pitch about what your startup is up to and uh, any particular questions like uh, hello yeah hi nanda yeah, uh, can, can you, you hear us Can you hear us? Uh, yeah. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, your voice was breaking. Can you tell me your last statement? Yeah. Can you can you give a one minute description of your startup to Pradeep, and any particular uh, you know one question that you would uh, like him to address during this session? Okay. Uh, so, uh, Digisec 360 um, is a cyber security firm. We provide essential uh, cyber security uh, control. We help organizations to help uh, implement cyber security controls, uh, especially awareness and assessment, and vulnerability management uh, solutions. And uh, uh, it, it's been more than two years. We are into this uh, uh, field. Uh, we are um, at early customer um, you know, st- uh, attraction stage. Uh, we have a product ready, uh, which is in a prototype phase, which is a, a cloud-based SaaS platform uh, through which, uh, basically, it is acting as a service delivery uh, uh, platform. And uh, we want to help organizations which are like mid-size or small uh, companies 
uh, who do not have dedicated cybersecurity solution um, resources. So, um, uh, so th that is our target area. And my question to uh, 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 Pradeep will be: uh, Overall, like you know, uh, we have faced many challenges in last two uh, years. You know, um, uh, right, right from getting the right resources or you know building the team is a big challenge. Uh, so. Uh, my, um, I mean, I'm seeking input from this area. <laughs> okay. Building the team and uh, getting the uh, skilled resources in cybersecurity because uh, this this is a field of where uh, getting good people is a big big concern. You know, like, and that too, uh, they join. They uh, most of them are not ready to join startups like us, small companies. They would like to go for MNCs or big companies where they get big packages. So, that's my uh, question. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Nanda. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think uh, all the hey. founders on this call probably have the... You know, hey, have Rajiv. The... Yes, hey, hi, Rajiv. Mohit. Mohit here. Yeah, I yeah. think there was some problem. No worries. So, uh, yeah. so hi, Pradeep. Uh, Mohit here. Uh, so basically, um, uh, we as a startup, right, we have a six integrated products. We are trying to help customer in order to identify their risk posture and then protect and then recover from there onward. So the, there are a couple of cha challenges what we see at this point of time uh, and few of them are already discussed. Uh, like what would be an innovative approach, right? When you are talking about hosting all your platforms on let's say a cloud, right? Because you need to manage the commercial aspects. You need to manage the volume of data which will be bringing over the time, right? This is one. The second is uh, again, uh, while you design your solution, right? Uh, how will you or what is the innovative approach to handle uh, millions of data that will eventually come, right? You can't have your design which is keep on changing. So what would be a right strategy more on to a database design when volume is so high? And then while you are building your solution based on ML AI blockchain, right? So th those are the aspects along with other questions are already discussed. So I will not jump on to those specific points at this point of time. OK, cool. Uh, thank you, Mohit. I think we can address these questions as well. All right, let's move on. I think we have a few more. Nitish from Extra. Uh, hi, good morning, Pradeep. Uh, good, good morning, Good morning, Nitish. everybody. Uh, good morning. So Extens uh, provides solution to prevent emerging uh, threats attack at uh, network perimeter level. Uh, so, in short, you can say it's a threat focus, firewalls, firewall. Okay. So, the challenge that we have faced is basically uh, because of our limited resource, uh, we don't have much, uh, I mean, people to uh, take care of all the, I mean, uh, area of the stack. For an example, from hardware, system side, backend side, and UI UX. So, well, that's the problem basically like uh, resource crunch to deliver the full fledged uh, product okay awesome all right thank you nitish all right so let's jump on to pratiba from secura hi pratiba good morning pratiba can Can you hear us? Okay. Okay. Looks like some we, we have some audio issues. We are not able to hear you. So we can come back come back to you later. Uh, let's go to uh, Riaz from Esai Labs. Hi, Riaz. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Ah, okay. Great. Okay. See. So, uh, ECI Labs is basically a cybersecurity platform. The reason why we are bringing uh, ECI Labs is to address the, the challenges specific to the application security. Okay, so the ECI Labs specifically designed to support the customer who are having web applications, and uh, we also call it AppSec 360. So we are uh, identifying the asset for our web applications, and we are uh, detecting the security threats for the web application, and we are providing a mitigation and uh, response mechanism as a red platform. So it's a combination of a product and professional services. So the product will discover, detect the issues for all type of uh, application assets. And uh, we have a backend team who will support to address the threats which we have discovered. Okay. So th this is the theme of the, the ESI Labs. And currently we are on a traction stage. 
uh so we we, uh, we have a pilot is already launched we have few customer who are testing it out and we have found some bugs which we are currently fixing it so hopefully we are ready to launch in uh, august 15 that's our target date let's see you know uh, so the question here right uh, currently we have built out everything as a saas platform uh, in a distributed architecture uh, but uh, there are challenges in terms of like you know stackable model so we are moving to kubernetes now so i would like to know some kind of like uh, you know recommendation or a good practices uh, you know converting transitioning the the actual uh, the hardware to the i mean when i say like it's a virtual computer to container so in a distributed architecture system so i don't know which is good currently we have a good performance but uh, just to reduce the cost and uh, become like a cost effective we are thinking to migrate it to the kubernetes platform so i just would like to know your uh, you know inputs on uh, what would be the better model sure we'll do we'll try to address this thank you riyas we have a couple more let's go to chetan from sikonize hello hi chetan hey good morning um, good morning can you hear me okay hello pradeep um, hi rajiv morning yeah so i am uh, chetan from uh, sikonize uh, i am the uh, co-founder and ceo so we are in uh, continuous and contextual uh, automated cyber risk assessment uh, product uh, cloud product and we also do automated uh, compliances uh, as well um, we are in an early traction uh, stage uh, so some of the challenges that nanda mentioned so we had them uh, early on you know how do we attract uh, best talent and how do we also build world class products while competing against some of the companies from around the world uh, who are also heavily funded and they have very good skill sets and so on Uh, that was the first challenge but i think we have come a uh, far uh, way away from that right now the challenge is how do you take from early stage to a like a general availability product where you respect all the you know data sovereignty laws across you know various regions at the same time also provide good documentation and such right so it's a whole sum product not just a technology product so that is what uh, we are looking at now and building uh, out now so any thoughts on that of how you take it from early stage to a ga uh, product Okay, I think this is the first request uh, that uh, that I've seen in in taking an early stage to GA. So I'll see if I can spend about two to three minutes just on this question, uh, depending on time, and maybe more. I'll definitely try to address this. All right. So I think we have a couple more joins. So let's. Uh, this is. turning out to be a bit different from the other sessions where we are actually hearing a lot from the startups so let's spend a couple more minutes uh, pradeep and sure. uh, have have i think there are two other startups that have just joined so let's uh, can we hear it from uh, mr hari of rally scale hi hari uh, hello hi uh, good morning this is hari uh, can you hear me yes please yeah. go ahead Yeah, the uh, really scale consulting is basically a IT consulting and professional services company. We are purely into services. Uh, of course, there are products which are being used for augmenting the services what we deliver. We work with uh, small and medium sized companies uh, in building their capacities for meeting various uh, uh, governance, uh, risk, and compliance uh, issues. So we have worked with a few companies to get them ISO certified, SOC two certified. Currently, we are working with a few for high trust HIPAA and uh, SOX uh, compliance. Uh, okay. We, apart from that, we also do uh, a lot of uh, workshops and uh, transformation on DevOps. Uh, so that has been our core focus uh, at this point. My main question would be: uh, Okay, it's uh, almost two years now since we started. So it's relatively a small team what we are operating now, but uh, purely a services player. Uh, how exactly to scale up to the next level? Uh, in fact, we want to bring in more people and uh, expand across some cities. Uh, th- that's a goal, but uh, uh, we don't know how exactly that will be done. Uh, also, another thing: to what extent one can uh, do this digital marketing? I have been keep hearing, but whenever I meet somebody, they say, "Don't expect any results for six months. You keep investing thirty thousand, forty thousand a month." Uh, forget about the results for six months. So this is putting us into a kind of chicken and uh, dilemma. So I would like uh, Pradeep's expertise to say how exactly one should look at it. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Hari. Yeah, I think that's not exactly true that you just pump money into marketing and it, it don't expect anything. Anyway, I'll address this. Uh, so, so thank you. Yeah. 
Cool. So I think we have one last startup, Pradeep. Uh, we have Siphons. Uh, so either Ashish or Harish, whoever has uh, the audio enabled. Okay. Um, looks like we might not have them on the audio. So let's get started. I think this is a good okay. start. Uh, so thank you all for uh, sharing questions. I mean, sharing your uh, startups sort of pitch, one or two minute pitch and the major questions. So they are obviously across the spectrum, right? Uh, from hiring to sort of scaling, going from early stage to uh, uh, general availability and UI, UX, backend, cloud, all over the place. So I think uh, Pradeep is the perfect guy because he has been in the space for, uh, I think, more than 15 years, as far as I know, uh, across engineering, product, early. I mean, he's been through the accelerator. He has been the ex CTO of the Microsoft Accelerator, working closely with startups, specifically on such questions, you know, broad questions. So, uh, so yeah, so Pradeep, please uh, take it away. Awesome. Hey, thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, so at a very high level, I, I took some notes when everyone was 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 mentioning their their issues and problems. And at a very high level, it boils down to fundamentally team building, uh, how to build good user interfaces, and there are some specific questions about how to scale out the the team beyond an early stage, and also uh, how to spend marketing efforts. Right? Okay, so let's go. Uh, so. Okay, you guys have all come here. So fundamentally, why should you just spend two hours here, right? Uh, my my goal here is ultimately that address all these questions, and and in addition, you fundamentally know more about yourselves and your startup towards the end of this session, and learn what matters and what doesn't. Um, so I'll also focus on what not to do a lot because many times what to do is very prescriptive, and you would have heard it a million times from everybody. Uh, so we kind of get blindsided and we kind of do things that are not optimal. So I'll also focus on what not to do rather than what to do. And uh, I'm going to talk about an engineer's perspective on how to go about sales, product, and customers as a technology person, right? Uh, and and I, I presume that most of the founders here are technical. I don't hear anybody coming from a pure business background um and i'll talk all of these with respect to enterprise or b2b startups uh, so even though i have some experience in consumer startups that is not applicable here because most of you all are building for the enterprise or business to business okay so in addition to what challenges you guys have listed what i have seen as one of the major challenges is that this, this vitamin versus painkiller um, uh, prerogative, right? You, you all might have heard about this, but what it means is that uh, at, at, so, at some stage, every startup is, is a vitamin, right? It's a nice to have. Uh, there are a few exceptions who are painkillers, which means that you can't live without these startups. And pretty much every success story on this planet, every startup which has become immensely successful has been a painkiller, which means it has, it has been able to solve a specific set of problems for a, a, a niche population to begin with, and this population has exploded, and you know the the startup has been able to address this uh, niche uh, need across multiple uh, sectors of the population and become big. Right? Take any example: consumer, enterprise, um, B two B, whatever. They all fall into the painkiller uh, spectrum, right? Uh, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, if you are dealing with anything in the public sector, defense, or government, many times even a vitamin, which is a nice to have, can become very successful in a government related or a defense related uh, uh, sector, right? Purely because uh, these organizations are extremely risk covers. Um, they don't really go by pain points. They go by bureaucracy. They go by what needs to be done. I mean, you know about all these things. So the, apart from these exceptions, all the successful startups today have addressed or, or more or less they are, they are painkillers, right? And of course, team growth, like you guys have mentioned. Uh, what I want to also address during team growth is there is this concept of, uh, oh, okay, you know, I have a small team now. I need to bring in somebody from outside to lead this team. Um, and so that I can kind of look at 
as a CEO and a founder, I can look at, uh, you know, the other aspects of startup which need my attention. Uh, and that is one frame of thought. And the other frame of thought is, uh, should we groom leaders in-house? So I'm going to address this as well. And tech stack, right? Engineering software. Uh, what, what do you fundament? How do you optimize essentially? Uh, how do you optimize your tech stack so that you don't run into over, uh, you know, too many expenses, especially on the cloud? Um, and also, should you focus on any metrics, uh, even in the early stages, right? And of course, I was surprised that nobody mentioned raising money. Um, so I will talk a bit about uh, how to raise money, when to raise, rather than how or when, kind of what are the factors that will contribute to a successful fundraise, right? I will touch upon this raising money towards the end. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Okay, so let's go into this vitamin versus painkiller. And, and please feel free to interrupt me uh, at any point of time. I am speaking a little little fast. I can slow down. Um, so if you feel that I'm going too fast, somebody just shout and say, hey, slow down, dude. I'll slow down. And if you have any questions, just say I have a question and I'll stop. Okay. Okay. Uh, so... This is the fundamental metamorphosis of a startup, right? So you start with an idea, you validate that idea, uh, you kind of get some growth potential. Uh, sorry, did somebody want to say something? Okay, I'll continue then. No, I think you're fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Pradeep, Pradeep, I don't know if it is only me, but your audio is... Uh... Is, uh, is jittering a bit now and then. I don't know if okay. it's your video is uh -huh. on as well. We are Let able to hear fine, Rajiv. Okay, good. So we can uh, keep going. Yeah, I just cut out the video so that there are no bandwidth issues. Okay, so you start with an idea, you validate that idea. When you validate this idea, you kind of get a hint for some growth potential. As soon as you get a hint for that growth potential, you experiment. Um, and this experiment you know, luckily proves to be successful. Then you kind of start building more, you go into the growth phase. And, you know, if, if everything goes well, you will see insane growth as you as soon as you put your prototype or, uh, you know, your MVP out uh, for people to consume, right? And this is the holy grail. I mean, once you reach insane growth, it's just a, what do you say? It's just like a nuclear fission reaction, right? It keeps feeding itself. The growth feeds more money, uh, more money. With more money, you can hire more resources. Uh, assuming you don't screw up any of these aspects, you will just become go on a rocket ship, right? But not all of us are that lucky. Uh, many times what happens is you, you experiment, you build, and you feel that you are, you are not addressing the pain points or the pain that you assumed your, your, in your hypothesis is not valid. So what happens is you typically either fizzle out or you kind of uh, go into what is known as a zombie state where you are not growing very fast, but at the same time, you are not dying also, right? So how do you, I mean, at, at, at some point of time, we all get into this vitamin phase, right? All startups get into a vitamin phase, regardless of, of, I mean, I mean, but for a very few exceptions, right? And they all come out of this vitamin phase uh, very successfully. So that's it's 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 important to address that we have to learn how to come out of this. Nice to have my product is a nice to have versus my I have to go into for a nice to have product to a must have product, right? So uh, th this is what makes or breaks a startup practically, right? Uh, now you can. You can take any amount of time to reach this uh, phase from vitamin from a vitamin to a painkiller. Uh, of course, it is a function of the resources that you have, money that you have, but you have to address this aspect. Without without becoming a painkiller, your startup will not be successful. Right. So, what is success? I mean, success is a very uh, subjective term, uh, but but at a generic level, right? I mean, at a very high level, if you can say that I'm growing consistently quarter on quarter. Uh, or year on year, I can say that I'm successful, right? If I'm growing 20% month on month, month, on month, then I can say I'm, I'm extremely successful. Um, and this is what really matters for, for everything. And if you reach this stage, 
automatically many of your other concerns will be addressed because you will be able to raise money and with money a lot of problems can be solved okay um it it's like and it also happens that when you reach a certain steady state in a startup right or, or by this time you are no longer a startup you are you are you are in a steady state and at this point of time it so happens that some of the product features that you have will become nice to have not all of your product features will be painkiller features this is okay this is completely fine this is kind of the natural way of this is the natural progression so uh, you have to keep in mind that at some point of time some features of your product will do become uh, nice to have not everything will be a painkiller but the preliminary or, or the main driving factors in your product will be the painkiller features right um uh, hey pradeep can you sorry one one uh, thing that maybe you can touch upon here can you also at this point Raj, rajesh sorry your audio broke can you can you repeat that last statement yeah can you can you also touch upon a particular thing being a feature versus a product versus a platform or a company because a lot of lot of uh, times people set out to build things Uh, as a company but they might actually be you know just a specific feature that fits in a within a broader product that they might or might not have okay sure um well i mean ev- everything starts off as a feature correct um uh, and and typically in in the early stage um your product your feature and your company are more or less like one homogeneous entity right so it's very rare where you kind of uh, within the first 6 months to a year of your uh, product you kind of have uh, 10 12 features that that you want to build right um it it will be like one major feature that you all want to focus on uh, that that you will build and you will address correct uh and it and again it boils down to the pain point that you are addressing right so if you are addressing more than one pain points uh probably you will not be uh you know resourced optimally to do this so it's always better to go after a a, a single pain point and address that right and which is what will eventually result in your in your feature so yc has uh i don't know if you guys have applied to yc uh, they have uh, their, their 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 first slide in the deck is what is what are the ma- three major pain points or three or four major pain points that your product addresses and what are the corresponding solutions to these pain points right and these solutions are the features and ideally in your initial stage there is going to be only one major pain point and and one solution to that pain point now you can break down the solution into multiple chunks and because you can you can manage it as smaller chunks but overall you will have one feature versus a a a a pain point that you are addressing eventually uh, as your uh, pain point addressal goes uh, you know goes into the next stage where let's say you take uh, let's take a, let's say you take uh, some some you, you take a problem statement you are now you have sent a prototype you have sent a prototype to 100 uh, startups or 100 uh, small and medium enterprises and uh, those 100 guys will look at this pain point and they're like okay this is great uh, you 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 have built in the essential product hooks you can measure it and but during this unraveling when they are using this product some 10 other pain points will emerge right and that comes as feedback to you and now you are like oh okay you know i need to address these other pain points and now your feature list grows so now your product is 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 a set of features rather than just being one feature right and this cycle continues um we get into uh, something called feature creep but that's not really relevant in an early stage uh, you typically uh what what should i say you typically tend to address only the features that you can right uh, you don't typically have the resources 
that the big company has where you can say okay you know these are two great fe- two priority one features that i need to address but there are also 10 priority five features that i can address because i have a big team that does not happen in in your early stage startups you can only address the priority features so by by the design of of a, of a startup of an early stage you don't uh, look at nice to have features at all you only kind of look at the the main features that address the pain points does that make sense okay i'll take silence as a yes and uh, let's go on okay um so what are some of the critical aspects of this transition right um uh, one is product iteration velocity uh do note that i'm not mentioning speed here uh because just speed does not really help you need velocity so velocity means you need direction in addition to speed right uh, so you need to really know what direction you are going in and you need to move fast in that direction without without direction even if you move fast it does not really matter right so how do you get this direction you get this direction mainly by listening to customers so there is a lot of gyan out there on how to talk how to interview customers where everybody comes with a series of questions they're like okay you need to ask these questions to your customers and then figure out these answers and from there take it on right but that's not really it what what really makes a painkiller is listening to your customers and i would highly recommend if uh, people have not read this document called mom test that is out there it is publicly available it's you can just search for mom test and you'll get this document it mom test is fundamentally a way of listening to customers right and the way you do it is you just pose a a question and you don't expect a yes or no answer uh, you rather have an answer that kind of elaborates on the question thereby revealing what the customers needs really are right so if for example if you came and asked uh, ask me uh, do you have any troubles with your internet right i i will most likely say no um because at a very high level i don't have any troubles with my internet right rather than that if you kind of uh came to me and and asked uh, hey pradeep uh, when you're doing your zoom call uh, do you face do you face any issues uh, how do you go about these uh, is your internet connection stable enough then kind of my thought process is is more uh, granular now right now i'll be like okay you know uh, yes during when i'm doing conference calls there is this jittery problem that i face time on time in and time on time out um now you can go deeper into the into this to to unravel what exactly is the problem right uh, this is what mom test is all about mom test is figuring out how you approach um uh, a customer with the aspect of unraveling what their needs are rather than just answering questions right and it is called a mom test because uh, there is a there is a story where i mean it's it's not a story but a guy a son wants to build a product and he goes to his mom and he says uh, hey mom i'm building this uh, what do you think can you give me some feedback and the mom is like she doesn't look at the product or what he's building but just because is her son she gives him very positive feedback saying oh yeah this is fantastic go go about doing this this is great but eventually when he builds that and takes it to his his other friends they'll he'll get no response right so that that's why it's called a mom test because you don't want to do this you don't want to kind of ask questions that uh, reinforce your beliefs rather than kind of unraveling what the problems are right um this is extremely critical that you do it is extremely critical that you do this because without doing this you can't build a painkiller product right you will end up being in a vitamin state you will end up being in a nice to have state um as is is software engineering really, really critical during early stage startup no not at all i mean what i mean by software engineering is like processes 
Um, do I need to have a QA team? Do I need to do this QA cycle? Do I need to follow a sprint? Do I need to follow waterfall versus agile? Not really, it doesn't really matter what you do. And I'll give examples of why this is the case. Lines of code, right? Uh, it's very critical. So the less number of, uh, the less lines of code you write, the better it is, right? Um, this is purely because there are newer languages now. Uh, I wouldn't say new, but I mean, it, uh, it's a new way of programming where you, uh, you write less code. You don't write a lot of code. And there are some languages like Python, Ruby, uh, with their constructs, they enable you to write less code uh, versus a very verbose language like, I don't know which is a verbose language now. Even C++ and Java have become very concise. Maybe C, right? If you're writing program, uh, if you're writing code in C, it's very verbose. So you would, you're, you're better off avoiding verbose languages and you're better off writing less lines of code and it's super critical and I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay. Uh, there is, there is some people think about, okay, you know, should I choose a language that is extremely fast like C++ versus I should I choose Java? It doesn't really matter. I mean, your speed of code execution, it, it, it does not matter at all. I mean, even if you take the slowest language and if you write less lines of code, you're better off doing that, right? Um, so uh, somebody asked the question of how do we optimize our resources, uh, especially uh, engineering resources during our initial days uh, and not spend too much money uh, with respect to cloud infrastructure, right? Uh, the key to doing that is, is is spending less time on your on your cloud infrastructure right and you can do that by following some some basic tools that are available free of cost now i think github is free of cost um uh, persistence any kind of database that you want to use today is free of cost you don't pay anything for for the database um Containers, I, I will highly recommend if people have not thought about containers to think about containers right from day one. I'll tell you why, because purely because it, it enables, uh, it, it, take, it saves a lot of your time in installing software, right? Even if you, because you're optimizing for cost, you don't typically, you just use plain, plain vanilla VMs on the cloud, right? Uh, I don't think anybody is going after a platform here. Uh, if, you are, if you are going after a platform, please don't do that. Uh, just use plain vanilla VMs. And if you use plain vanilla VMs, we spend time on installing software and that time costs money. Um, and also time is more precious than money uh, in a startup, right? So you're better off using something like Docker because you don't install anything. You just can get started within two minutes. Let's say, for example, you want to get started with MySQL. And trust me, when I, when I install, I mean, if I go about installing MySQL, it will take at least 30 minutes because it's not just installing the software. You have to create the table. I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a whole, uh, you know, orchestrated mechanism you need to follow. So instead of that, you can just use a Docker container and be done with it, right? And also you should, you should definitely write unit tests right from the get go. And why you should write unit tests is because this saves time in the interim and even in the long run. Um, because what happens is many times it's not just you're, you're executing your code once you're executing your code multiple times. And every time you run your code, you run into issues. And if you don't have unit tests, you have already lost time in unraveling those, these issues, right? So if you kind of follow these at least four basic principles, um, you will save a lot of money on your uh, public infrastructure, which you would not otherwise, right? Because the more time you spend on a VM, the more money you're spending on, on, on that infrastructure, right? I mean, and also there is, there is this thing of bandwidth, correct? Um, uh, where you have too much data flowing in and flowing out and almost all of cloud infrastructure costs are bandwidth related costs. But I don't think anybody here is is really uh, uh, constrained by by bandwidth because I don't think you're moving a lot of data around. Nobody's moving petabytes of data around, right? So mainly it is it is the time that you spend on your cloud infrastructure. Um, okay, so why you should not think about 
optimizing code from the get go um there is this very famous story about ebay where um they just until even until they were uh, they reached a market cap of nearly a billion dollars their entire code the core of ebay was in one dynamic link library one dll and they they ran into they started refactoring code they started optimizing code when actually the compiler ran into the limits of the number of functions a class could have right it is something like 16000 or some 20000 so imagine writing a class with 20000 functions reaching the compiler limit and only then optimizing this uh, all of us would think that like all of us who have engineering backgrounds will think this is nuts i mean nobody will do this this is ridiculous right but ebay did it uh, not because why i'm saying this is because uh, you shouldn't really focus on optimizing code in the beginning you have to focus on essentially writing less code and writing so that you can you have, to, you have to focus on fast iteration and and greater velocity um and you should always pick a language that is easy and that the team is familiar with right please do not go after exotic languages just because it is out there in the market and you want to try something new like okay there is rust in the language in the, in the, in the industry and i want to go after rust ideally you should not do this ideally you just should just pick something that is simple easy to understand everybody is familiar with and and a language that has a massive ecosystem right um so so there was a question asked about uh, you know in early resourcing in in when i when i when i'm building a team right i should uh, i want to hire more i mean i i i want to hire people who are extremely capable but they all want to work in big companies uh because the big companies offer greater packages right one way you can counter that and attract people to working in your startup right is to say that listen most of the big companies use bloated software and the impact that you make by writing code in that bloated software is nowhere what you can do with a stack that we have which is easy to use easy to iterate and the impact can be seen on day 1 or day 7 right now for a uh, for an engineer this is this is really 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 attractive right so if somebody came to me and said and if let's assume that i was working in uh, know, wherever microsoft right and if somebody said okay what is your day to day in microsoft i mean how much time do you actually spend on writing code versus like spending a lot of time on all the other uh you know processes associated with the language right then i say then then i'll be like okay you know i don't really spend a lot of time writing code uh, my code uh, spent time code uh, sorry time spent on writing code is x whereas my time spent on processes is 10x right now you say that listen with us for example we write code in python it's it's extremely fast i mean it's it's extremely fast to write it is simple to write and you can understand code very easily and you can iterate very fast right um and python has a massive engineer ecosystem that maybe uh, uh, other languages don't have right um when i say engineer ecosystem it's a, it's a, it's a very startup we driven ecosystem the python ecosystem right i mean if you look at stack overflow uh, most of the uh, answers and questions are startup related questions you don't see too many enterprise related questions uh, in 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 a language like python so this is <clears throat> a, a very uh, what should i say a very effective way to pull talent away from from big companies um you can't do a lot of pay arbitrage uh, that is unfortunately the market reality uh, you can't pay a lot with you can't play a lot with pay like for example you can't pull somebody from microsoft saying uh, okay i'm going to pay you know 1/10 of what microsoft is paying that will just not fly you have to you have to kind of pay market salaries but 
the lure of uh, doing something tangible and meaningful in a language and in an ecosystem that is more agile more fast iterative is very very attractive to an engineer okay <clears throat> um and yes you have to test even faster this goes back to my um, emphasis on writing unit tests why should you test faster uh, because testing unravels or or you come across problems that your customers would face right and it's better off catching these problems up front than catching it later in the in the cycle now i'm not saying you should like build a whole uh, what should i say a qa pipeline like how these big organizations do that's not what i'm talking about here what i'm talking about is simple unit tests that are built into your uh, source code control uh, process and if you use something like github you can use a github actions to kind of script your way into running these tests every time somebody makes a pull request right uh, i don't know how much uh, how familiar you guys are with with, with source control but I'll, i'll i'll give a simple example of how to do this right so you have a set of uh, you somebody writes code uh, they uh, commit that code and then this is typically forked from a from a master repo right and now you have to merge this uh, this branch this this branch or fork into the into the master and when you do this typically failures occur because there is some merge conflicts there is uh, code functionality that is broken and all that but if you have a hook that is built into this pull request which says that hey you have not run unit tests i don't see the unit test results without this you can't merge this code into the into the master that simple task of writing this action and spending some time on doing this uh, this uh, setting up this discipline saves immense amount of time in the long run because imagine now you have let's say four members in your team and four members are sending pull requests and somebody who is maintaining this repo has to manually look at all these aspects it's 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 insane i mean you can't do this in a sustained in a sustained way doing automating this and putting using software to kind of put these actions in place has immense payoff it helps you save time in return it helps you to save money okay which is what i'm trying to kind of get to at it automate every manual task uh, i'll give you a simple example right uh, do do any of you use uh, the uh, command line tools for for the public cloud for amazon uh, i think aws azure and gcp are the three public clouds that everybody uses and all of them have command line tools do you guys use the command line tools can can someone say yes or no does yeah we do have a unit test uh, using like a web driver selenium and uh, eclipse also we extensively leverage the gcp command line for our automations wonderful uh, are there others doing this okay so i i take it that they are not Par- partially partially okay uh this is extremely i think this is critical you guys have to do this I, i'll tell you why because see every time you are opti- you are trying to optimize on cloud cost right so you don't want to run machines running all the time uh, you don't want to wa- uh, leave machines running 24 by 7 so what you do is you get up in the morning you go and start your machines uh and in the night when you are closing down you end these machines you stop these machines right now like all of us are not this disciplined we can't no matter how much you want to pay and, and you don't want to spend too much energy thinking about when to start my machines and when to stop my machines you should leave that to automation so one is one way to optimize this is to use amazon lambda um which is very simple to set up i'm pretty sure i don't know if azure and gcp have lambda equivalents i think they should have set up just check out amazon uh, the lambda functions on aws and just set up an automated task that will start all machines at 8 o'clock in the morning and shut down all machines at uh, whenever 8 or 9 in the evening 
right? This itself is one, one good check that you have, right? Now, in addition, if you have command line tools, uh, you don't have to go open a web page on AWS and then navigate to the EC2 dashboard, select the machines, stop, start, do whatever you want, right? With a command line tool, you are saving at least five to 10 minutes of operation that you would do on the web, which what you can do on the command. Now, five to 10 minutes uh, per command over you know a month or two of uh, writing code is, is a lot, right? It, it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you collectively look at this, it's a lot of time that you're wasting. You should not waste this, this, this amount of time because you have other precious tasks to get to. That's why you should always use command line tools. And it, maybe you'll spend uh, half an hour or one hour or a couple of hours initially getting all this set up. But it's incredibly valuable once you get this set up in, your, in the rest of your journey, okay? Uh, yeah, so this is what I was alluding to. And pretty much whatever you can do on the browser, you can do from the command line. And once you get used to it, it's incredibly, incredibly fast. You will never go back to your web interface. You'll do everything on AWS command line. Okay. Um, also, there was another question asked about how to optimize uh, cloud resources so that you're not spending a lot of money. So this addresses that question. Uh, you don't have to, uh, there is a lot of noise about microservices, uh, you know, the, the the latest and the greatest, we we have to kind of follow this microservice pattern so to be effective and all that. It's not it's not totally true. You can just build a monolith and and be incredibly successful, right? Um, so to give a scale example, right? Uh, Facebook. So Mark gave a talk on. Uh, on their, uh, he gave a talk at Stanford when he was, uh, I think this was back in 2006, I think, um, when Facebook had just started and they were uh, slowly trying to expand out of colleges into, uh, into the general public. And he, he gave this talk in Stanford. It's not a very popular talk, but you can, you can search for it on YouTube, where uh, somebody asked him about uh, optimization and uh, should, what, what stack do you use or something like that. And, and at that time, uh, and I think even till date, Facebook just uses MySQL with uh, uh, memcached as cache, right? They don't use any fancy, like maybe they use now, but at that time, there is no fancy like, you know, message driven architecture or there is no Kafka, there is no message queue, there is no Kinesis. I mean, none of these things. It's very simple. I have a, a relational database as persistence I have a cache to optimize on that persistence, to optimize my speed, uh, to optimize my read queries. And then I have a web server, right? That's about it. Now, if you just do this, even if it's on a single machine, like a, a single large instance, right? Single M5 large instance on the cloud, you can, you can scale and you can, you can address a lot of your, uh, you know, early startup to mid startup concerns without having to go into a distributed setup, right? Um, there are some exceptions to this though. So you might have, uh, you might be like, I think somebody was mentioning about uh, addressing some forensic related data in with regards to government and all that. Um, so if you're dealing with sensitive data that you, you can't afford to lose, right? Then maybe you should have a database that uh, supports, what should I say, like a, a, a distributed multi, uh, multi-host architecture, right? Something like a Cassandra or even like a master-slave setup in, in MySQL. But for that, but for those critical use cases where data is extremely important for you, um, you are really better off just using a single database with a cache and a simple web server uh, with running the, running all of this on a single machine. You are you are way better off. Hey Pradeep, 
is it fine yeah. to interrupt you on question sure see uh, acl apps we took into the approach of a triangle method like a web server only talks to the db for writing and all the caching we are handling using the elastic search okay uh, but we know initially we thought about the memcache but uh, nowadays looks like elastic search as a much more convenient way of uh, you know docker container and uh, just spinning it with the indexer loading the data is much more faster right so the question here like uh, Uh, the the front end and the user database i mean we don't need to maintain the caching for the user related uh, aspect right the only for the large volume of data with the uh, the detection or the, the the data what we discover that we store it on the caching that approach should be okay right i mean we we basically restrict the access from web server to the database by firewall well so there are two aspects right uh, so let me address the caching aspect first so what you cache is 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 totally subjective to the startup right so typically you cache data that needs a very high uh, sorry sorry the, the latency has to be extremely low right for example um my uh, facebook news feed right and i can't afford to have the news feed pop up 5 seconds after i open my app correct at least some part of the news feed has to come right away um and if all my news feed is sitting in a database without a cache i can't accomplish this so it is mostly a read cache cache is mostly for reading right and it is in order to reduce latency on the most frequently used items so which is what you use a cache for now uh, elastic is 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 more than a cache right elastic is not primarily a cache elastic is elastic is a is a, a full text search engine um which has a ton of other features in addition to caching right you are better off using something that will serve purely as a cache uh just because it will be efficient at the task and it will be cheaper right for example redis redis is a is a supremely fast cache that you can use uh and pretty much every startup uses redis that that i know of correct uh, it, and mostly cache is because it's a re, it's a read cache you typically need a key value store uh because you are reading a person's user id uh, related data correct now if you have for example a uh, user id related data in multiple tables on the uh, relational data store and you have to join these tables and then fetch that data it's it's slow rather you would have have had that data pre populated in your redis cache as a key value store uh, with your user id and all the data readily available so that you can pump the data out really fast and okay. also almost all caches are in memory caches okay it's same like a query only okay got it yeah okay yeah, um, thank you some like so aerospike also can be used as a cache uh, shameless plug uh, but the uh, the difference is that aerospike also persists data so uh, if for whatever reason you lose data in a cache uh, in your memory your server goes down or or something like that then your data is still on disk and you can pull it out but if you are using a cache you don't really need persistence because your data is already persisted in the database makan karan makan to karan makan like to uh sorry can somebody please go on mute uh, it's, it's a lady or a girl uh, uh hey rajiv uh, can somebody from the organizing committee mute that uh, person hi this is pratibha i need to go on mute i am not able to go myself on mute uh okay rajiv or somebody yeah. can help abbas uh, can you please uh, put pratibha on mute hi am, am i audible yes you are audible you are audible yes okay well, i had troubles as well okay uh, give me a second let me figure out um yeah i am not able to do it yes no i think uh, abbas is the organizer so abbas are you here 
Yeah, let, let's keep going. I will. Yeah, go let's keep going. I'll, I'll, it's all right. Uh, you guys can still see my screen, right? Okay. Okay. Any other questions on this on this aspect? Okay. So if you follow this simple philosophy of not uh, going into a microservice or a distributed architecture upfront, you will save a ton of money on your cloud costs. Um, there is one more trick. Uh, have, do you guys use spot instances? Anybody using spot instances? Uh, Pradeep, I have a question related to database. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, if uh, your web server and database is running in the same uh, uh, say VM or same machine, mm -hmm. do you suggest to like the interaction uh, through a encrypted channel like this Python connect? You know, there is a like what kind of connection with database would you uh, suggest? I mean, it it must be uh, like encrypted. Uh, sorry, the last part of your question I could not hear. Uh, but from what I gathered, the question is: Should we use encryption uh, in order to communicate between the web server and the database if both of them are on the same machine? Okay. Um, I mean, again, it, like I would say no to begin with, uh, because typically your server, if it is on the same machine, you're already the server is already secure, right? You have uh, you have like SSH, not which is proven to be extremely secure. You're not logging in through a password. You're only logging in through through a secure, you know, through a PEM on on, on SSH. So the box is already secure. However, once the data is stored in the database, you can use encryption. So many databases provide encryption at rest feature uh, where the data the data. <coughs> Once it is stored, it will be encrypted, but it comes at a cost. This encryption will slow down your your uh, latencies, right? So you have to figure out whether that uh, that trade off is worth it. If the trade off is worth it, please go ahead. Uh, if the trade off is not worth it, then don't do it. As far as the connection goes, you don't need any encryption channels between the connection. Um, I don't think any like like I'm not aware of. Any database driver that offers like a TLS encryption between because they, they primarily uh, communicate or, on raw sockets. So you like I said, if you feel that this the security needs to be in place, you can you can go and do it. But I would say no. Uh, if the default answer will be no. Right? And Pradeep, so here uh, I mean we are talking specifically about cybersecurity companies, right? So the bar is obviously the cybersecurity bar for themselves for their product is going to be much higher. So I would, I mean, if if I were doing you know building a company, then I would say at least for cybersecurity companies that the default should be yes. I mean, here we are talking about data at rest encryption. Right? Uh, and that also is also driven by uh, the regulation. And in most places, most of the regulations require, I mean, even in India, or if you look at GDPR and anywhere else, you do have a basic uh, level of encryption, be AS256, and, and there are certain very high level guidelines, right? So, there, I think for cybersecurity companies, otherwise, uh, the brand value risk is too great. And even as you know, just as a product, right? Uh, if you are delivering cybersecurity value to your customers, then the expectation is that your product itself will be secure. And there have been numerous instances where cybersecurity product themselves have not followed uh, basic cybersecurity hygiene, right? So yeah, that, I get I that. Uh, I think I think so. Let me clarify what I was saying, right? So encryption at rest. Like, like I said, all databases pretty much offer this out of the box. Um, you should, you should definitely use it because you are a cybersecurity startup. If your, if your database and if your middle, if your web server is on the same machine, um, the connection between the web server and the database does it also have to be encrypted? I, I, I don't. Yeah, that I'm not sure. Um, because 
pradeep sorry to interrupt you can you just confirm with everyone everyone able to hear you well because there is continuous breaking in your voice so i am not able to hear well oh really okay can can others confirm please i can hear clearly very clear no 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 it is going good but okay issues with the voice yeah i mean but for pratibha's background which we are not able to mute unfortunately yeah. um who are not you know who are unmuted and who might not be uh, talking or asking questions please go ahead and keep muting them there seem to be uh, riyas there seem to be some disturbances now and then but i think it's uh, probably uh, localized right i had some issues as well but now it's gone so maybe now it's at your end yeah got yeah, it sorry, sorry. please go yeah thank you i'll get okay all right so just to reemphasize what i was saying uh, you should definitely use encryption at rest i think that's probably the table stakes for you guys uh, for cyber security companies um if you have your database and web server on the same machine um you should also have all communications happening to this machine on https from outside right that's also a table stakes uh, for any company not just cyber security companies i think outside in traffic being on https is is a no brainer but inside this box the internal connectivity the jdbc or the python driver or uh, uh, the c++ driver that connects the web server to the database this is just binary data data that is being transmitted within the within the machine in memory to disk so i i i don't know if you really need to use encryption in that conduit channel Um, but but it's it's totally up to you if you feel that you need to use it please go ahead uh, oh. thank you pradeep i mean i just wanted to uh, get uh, i mean uh, pers- i mean your uh, thought on it thank you very much sure no problem any other questions Hey, uh, no questions, but a quick time check. It's uh, about ten fifteen. Yeah, we but have about forty-five minutes. I think this is going great. Yeah, yeah. We have, and we don't need to save uh, really any specific time at the very end because I think this is uh, turning out to be a fantastically um, discussion-oriented session, uh, very interactive. So, and people, if if uh, you do have questions, then as long as it is appropriate to the topic being discussed. please feel free to interrupt uh, let's not try to save it towards the very end because then we lose all the context okay all right uh, so i just alluded to this before uh, please avoid any platform as a service which means you're not using dynamo db you're not using uh, kinesis you're not using rds you're not using any of the platform offerings whatsoever It, this might seem alluring, and somebody you might attend some session in one of these uh, uh, cloud, uh, you know, uh, meetups, or uh, Azure might call you, Microsoft might call you, and say, "Hey, we'll give you some credits. Use this, blah blah blah." Just say no. Just don't avoid. Just avoid pass like it's plague, right? It's extremely expensive to use pass, and you you like the the and and it's a black box, right? i'll give you an example so if you use kinesis for for a message queue um, first of all you should not use a message queue and let's say you use one you are better off using kafka as a docker container it will take the same amount of time to get set up and all that if you use kinesis it's a it's a it's a freaking black box you don't know what's happening inside kinesis so for example you are pushing data on the producer side and you are pulling data on the consumer side for whatever reason you don't get the data on the consumer side now you don't know what's going on uh, inside inside kinesis and by the time you get to the logs by the time you figure out what's going on you already have spent an inordinate amount of time and it is expensive right so just just don't use dude, it, this this is just not a non starter always use plain vanilla vms with docker containers right um and The, the containerization has really transformed software packaging and delivery right i mean think of it it's just like how containers transform shipping uh, like 
prior to containers coming to shipping it was a total chaos you had like multiple packet sizes nobody knew there was no standard from ship to truck to train it was just a mess then came the standard and everything was streamlined which is exactly what the containers have done to the software world you just package your software as a docker container it will run on linux it will run on windows it will run on mac it doesn't really matter what the target ecosystem is um and it's fast it is it is super fast it is very resource in, uh, you know uh, efficient so there is no reason not to not to go after containers right and somebody had asked a question about kubernetes i'll just address that uh, to, to to start with here right you should, please don't go after kubernetes just avoid it it's it's a very complicated system you need special i mean you need you need people who are trained in kubernetes or who are willing to get trained in kubernetes to to run it um and there is a simple test you can do to do this right uh, try setting up a kubernetes cluster even like a like a three node cluster to begin with and you know the pains of going through this there is a famous blog post on uh, by the coin coinbase guys on why they don't use kubernetes and look look where coinbase is today uh, coinbase is a multi billion dollar startup today and even they have realized the pains of using kubernetes and they have refrained from doing so so um i think this was riaz who had asked this question so please please for heaven's sake don't go after kubernetes just avoid it um you are you can just use docker containers um and you can fundamentally you don't need an orchestration platform you can just manage the cluster uh, the containers manually um and with some scripts uh i mean uh, riaz if you have any specific questions on this maybe you can take it off offline one on one and i can talk more about this okay and always use resources that are reliable uh for example aws right now azure um and gcp are not as reliable as aws because fundamentally they have gone through like the, 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 the there are instances where AWS, azure like fall short like you lose data something happens um so it's it's better to avoid newer age platforms or if somebody comes up uh, with a new age cloud offering don't fall for that just use by default just use aws if you are on aws that would be my recommendation um and like i said don't use any fancy buzzword technology from cloud providers right they are using they are when a when a cloud provider peddles a technology to a startup it is in their best interest it is not in your best interest please understand this no matter the cloud provider any offering that they come to you and they offer please don't use uh, if it is a buzzword right um, and most of these buzzwords are in the platform as a service space just stay away from them um, you, you are way better off using just vanilla dms uh, vms and, and docker containers okay okay uh, team uh, so there are two approaches to this right uh, typically i'm going to address what what works and what doesn't right um, in my head and, it, and and statistically if you see the odds of startups uh, being successful are extremely high with founders who code okay this is a no brainer uh, so if there is any founder who feels that oh i should not code um, then probably that's not that's not right so uh, there are so many examples that you can you can look at history of of successful startups and you'll see all founders all successful companies have founders writing code until they get to like a series a series b stage right um th so this is paramount right uh now again this might be an exception uh, with cybersecurity startups you definitely need some specialists uh, who are well versed in 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 the specific problem that you are looking at uh, like i think uh, there was uh, i forget who it was but again the forensics guy who's 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 very specifically targeting forensic related uh, you know uh, problem statements with in 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 large organizations like defense uh, or even in crime you can't you can't work with generalists 
us, right? So you need specialists. There is absolutely, this is absolutely true of cybersecurity. But from a purely pure startup success perspective, right? You need generalists. Uh, the reason you need generalists is because you are uh, not capable of hiring 10 specialists for 10 tasks, right? Um, so you need somebody who can navigate through all these special specialities uh, very fast at a, at, at, a, at a high level, correct? Obviously, all generalists are uh, breadth oriented, uh, including myself. So I'm you're not a depth focused person. When I say depth, I mean, I'm, I'm talking of in depth, right? Uh, like, for example, Rajiv can talk about memory buffers and buffer overflows for a week, right? That's the depth I'm talking about. Um, anything that is not going into that that depth, you are a generalist. I mean, you are, you, you are a bread, bread person, correct? So you need these bread guys who can navigate multiple areas of uh, software stack in an early stage startup. And it's also a function of uh, knowledge and a function of attitude, right? So uh, you, there are people who will readily jump at some unknowns and they'll try to figure out what this unknown is. And, and they, they kind of thrive in this kind of environment. Okay. You ideally want people like this uh, who can tackle the unknowns without too much constraint or restraint. Okay. On the other hand, you have extremely talented people uh, who are very good in depth, but they will refrain from going into an area of unknown purely because it is, it is, it is not their comfort zone. Okay. So you need, uh, even if it, uh, quite honestly, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a bread person or depth person, but you need somebody who can take on unknowns uh, in flamboyance and flair. And this taking on an unknown characteristic is vastly prevalent in generalists, uh, sorry, generalists, uh, generalists than in specialists. Okay. This is what I've seen. Um, and you really need these kind of engineers in your in your team to begin with okay Which is what if, I, if, 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 I, if i may add uh, i think this is uh, also you know very applicable to the cybersecurity space because even even the cybersecurity might seem as a specific vertical it really is a horizontal that space uh, that, that spans multiple industries right uh, i mean every new technology so if you look at kubernetes okay there is a there, there are companies that are building security aspects of kubernetes environments right so there are cloud i mean you have multiple verticals within cybersecurity itself so even in your hiring be it forensics so you today you might be looking at a problem in forensics right but very soon that is going to uh, i mean obviously that is going to go into uh, let's say mobile devices when you're looking at mobile device forensics and it will go to cloud when you're looking i mean nothing is working in isolation uh, from a platform and technology perspective right so everything is connected so when you think of it that way even for a cybersecurity startup, I think it becomes very relevant from a hiring perspective to focus on people whose foundation in cybersecurity is really solid, right? And I would be very hesitant to uh, hire somebody who says, uh, you know, they are essentially, uh, uh, okay, I, I know AWS cloud security. And maybe there are cases, you know, where you will need that. But in an early stage startup, when you're really building a foundation of your cybersecurity startup, you really want genderless, in cybersecurity, right? Who can go from a specific feature that you're targeting today and to a different feature just because you know your customer really doesn't want the one that you started with. So you might actually move out of AWS and you might actually start uh, looking at uh, GCP or Azure or uh, something else, right? So you don't want to be stuck with uh, uh, someone right? or with uh, ideas that are very particular to a niche. So I think that. That aspect really holds even in the cybersecurity. Holds true even here. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is what I've, I, what I've seen uh, honestly is uh, like people who can, like you said, right? I mean, today you're focusing on problem one. Tomorrow that problem will not exist anymore. You will have a newer problem to to fix, and this 
team or this person has to be able to jump into that new problem and then solve it right away um and i mean you can say this is like you need like a full stack you need like a full stack cybersecurity guy right in your team guy or a girl uh, and you need, ideally you need a team of full stack cybersecurity engineers in your team who can navigate across all these aspects of 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 technology um and and because you guys are all cybersecurity startups i think those fundamental uh, bedrocks of cybersecurity are essential in every engineer uh, like how i would not hire a front end engineer um who just knows react and 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 angular frameworks but no squat about javascript right uh, without without knowing the fundamentals of javascript you can't really become a good uh, front end engineer frameworks come and frameworks go but your your foundations remain remain solid right the same principle applies here also yeah so i think uh, i uh, just to add to that right uh, generalists i think are fantastic but like pradeep was saying um, and this is somewhat particular to cyber security startups as well uh, if you are in a niche right going back to the earlier point about how most startups try to do everything right uh, essentially called boiling the ocean so that is not a good strategy when you are starting out right it's better to focus on one or two pain killer features that your 10 or 100 customers want than something that is so broad that 1000 or 10000 customers maybe need it i mean it's a nice to have but nobody really wants it so that is i think it's always a balance there are two sides to that story as with everything else uh, but if you think that you're building something very specific right let's say in forensics or in privacy or in you know cloud compliance or in vapt that is actually a good thing as well right because you're focusing on that one particular pain killer feature and this becomes super critical in cyber security because in cyber security unlike other disciplines nothing is isolated right i mean there is no really one cup even if you look at the biggest companies in cyber security right the by market cap if you look at uh, mcafee or symantec or any of the big startups uh, out of the valley right they all started by focusing on one uh, pain killer feature right one niche thing that they're really good at it could be apt it could be um, uh, you know uh, casb it could be any any of those things which seem really broad but that is what they focused on right and it is that one hole in the swiss cheese of security problems that they focused and later on as they grew they added more capabilities either organically by you know acquiring small teams and integrating them into bigger products with a good dash uh, dashboard to consolidate everything or inorganically by acquisition so if you look at mcafee uh, i mean that that keeps coming up if you look at their wikipedia they've had uh, more than 50 uh, to 100 100 acquisitions right so they don't try to build everything because in security you would have seen this when you go to sell something to uh, your uh, potential customer you might be building something very specific to aws cloud vapt in that space right but they might say hey that is good but i also want you know uh, y and z right so that sort of pushes you into sort of focusing on everything but that is i think a trait of that Uh, the startup should be very cognizant when you're making, right? Do I want to focus on one specific aspect as a specialist, as a from a startup perspective, or do I want to be a generalist at this point in my stage and build an okay kind of a feature for everything under the sun, right? So I think this sort of ties together, and I think I've seen this really in most of the cybersecurity startups that I've spoken to, even early stage. They they more more often than not. they do more than what is needed right so you offer a buffet of solutions than offering something a la carte and saying hey this is the best uh, uh, you know masala dosa that i'm serving instead of that you offer a buffet of 20 dosas and none of them really taste good so you really won't have many customers right so these are some of the trade offs i think that are relevant to what we need to talk about go ahead for this sorry to interrupt no 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 problem thank you rajiv i i think you should definitely not offer a buffet At, at any cost um and if you are offering a buffet you should really really look at what you're doing and and pick one of the buffet items and and go deep into that right i i think everybody knows this so so i'm just reiterating uh, some of the facts that are obvious um and founders are either coding or listening to customers right that's all you're doing 
nothing else if you are doing anything else uh, of course like some people have the responsibility of building a team um, then that that comes into play uh, so you are either coding or listening to customers primarily that's about it you should not be doing anything else and this is again a, a characteristic of every early every successful startup right almost every successful startup the first hires have always been from personal networks right um one because you know these guys uh, and i use guys as a very generic term you know these people it refers to women also so so please please don't think i'm only referring to to, to men um you know these people uh, you have already you already have some sort of rapport with them and you can get a lot accomplished if you get the first hires from your network because a lot of interpersonal issues are already sorted out right now now somebody might come and ask me what if i can't find people from my personal network to to work in my startup right now this should i mean at this point of time you should really stop and and question why you're doing this startup right think about this um if you for whatever reason i mean I, i i'm not saying this in a negative way but if you are not able to convince your close friends um or people in your in your cousins or first circle or, or whatever it is to at least come and take a stab at working with you in something that is going to become a a a, a mega success sometime in the near future if you are not able to do that then you should really look at how why why is this not happening that that why gives you a lot of answers to this vitamin versus painkiller uh, question right you should really introspect and ponder at that time if you are not able to get people from your first circle to actually come and work with you it it, it unravels a lot about yourself about what your startup is doing about the pain point that you are addressing and about the eventual success you will have this is a a fabulous proxy to evaluate all these things and typically what happens is if you are at a later stage in your career um like if you already are in your in your mid 30s or 40s the odds of finding somebody from your personal network to come and work with you are very low primarily because everybody has families people will not just they are not willing to take that risk even if you are willing to take the risk right so the odds of success um in this is are very high when you are young right like there is a reason why every investor goes after young founders it's not because of anything else it's purely because of of the network that they have and the network is an actionable network right uh, see for example even i have i have so many people that i know and there are at least five or six of my best friends with whom i would heartily start a startup today but even if my idea is good even if it has it is it has a rocket ship potential these guys will not come and work with me um because it they are already in stable jobs they already have families they already have kids some of them have kids who are about to go to college so they are not going to like jeopardize all that and and come and work with you uh, on a startup no matter how rosy this thing feels right uh, whereas if i had the same thing like 15 years back or 10 years back three four guys would have jumped in with me easily easily like in a, in a, in a blink of an eye um and and that's what you want you want these these really uh, passionate um engineers who you like who you can work with um and who are somewhat somewhat more or less on the same compass in in terms of talent right now it's it's it, if you are it is very rare that you you would not find talent in your in your first circle of friends it's very very rare it's it's almost unheard of because we all have like minded friends we all like it it's it's a given that your friends will be will be will be the you know will will not fail in uh, in a talent perspective now with cyber security that might be different uh, but 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 generally this is this is the case so try to get your first hires from your personal network as much as possible um and there is this uh, i don't know do any of you use contractors yeah. 
okay i think that's a no uh, i'll take the silence as a no uh, please don't use contractors uh, no matter what just stay away from contractors uh, i've had this experience both at epic one and a few other startups in my past contractors are just not worth it they charge a lot of money they don't work with the same passion as you do uh, they don't commit to the timelines the talent is below average and especially with something like cybersecurity i don't even think you will find contractors who can work on cybersecurity um related aspects uh, so i would just say stay away from contractors if you are ever thinking of doing this okay and also avoid bringing in outside team leads right uh, your your so what happens is typically when you bring somebody from the outside let's say it's it's hard to bring somebody from the outside to a startup because you won't be able to pay them well and all that let's let's take all of that out of the equation if you bring in somebody as an outside lead now if this person is from a large company they are not used to how a startup functions right uh, they will try to bring in a lot of the baggage that they have in the large company into this into your startup and that pretty much won't fly uh, any anything that says process is not going to fly in a in a, in a early stage or young startup you should have no process whatsoever which is why it's very easy to work with people who you know because process is there to cover the mistakes or 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 kind of do a cya right cover your ass for for the mistakes that you commit and with people you know you don't have this need we all i mean we all know that mistakes happen and you're okay with that i mean if you're not making mistakes then you're doing something fundamentally wrong in your startup uh, so as far as possible try to avoid bringing in team leads now there are exceptions to this there are exceptional people who will realize the potential of what you're doing they would have already worked in startups before um, before going to a large company and those people will be fed up with the large company setup they would want to come back to a startup and then make some impact these people you can definitely bring in they will be extremely valuable to your team uh, but apart from these exceptional cases overall just bringing in somebody from a tcs or an infosys just because he's a team lead there has managed a 50% team is not going to help you trust me um what are some of the red flags that you see in your team right uh, need for micromanagement now if you feel on a day to day basis that you need to follow up with your team for every small thing this is a huge red flag you should always have ownership in your team people should take on ownership and they should follow up and they should they should be proactive in letting you know what they've done and what has been successful um now by nature we indians we are not um uh, we are we are not that open when it comes to saying we have done something wrong or there has been a mistake um this is a cultural thing unfortunately which kind of doesn't really help startups so you should inculcate that you should take this away from your team this 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 cultural aspect has to be taken away from your team people should be flagging issues left right and center right uh, and if you are not hearing any issues from your team which means that you should not take it for granted that there are no issues with my product everything is good rather you should think okay something is fundamentally wrong why are people not bringing up issues um, and this is i think paramount to success right uh, if 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 your team is not vocal in highlighting mistakes that they have done and and even if that others have done um it kind of leads to a disastrous outcome down the line so you should actively try to avoid this as a founder you should day in and day out inculcate this uh this culture in your team that always flag mistakes and mistakes are not frowned upon mistakes are not i'm not going to blame anybody for these mistakes we should not blame people for mistakes rather than just look at fixing these mistakes okay and another red flag is uh, so as founders and as as people who have written software we have some gauge for how much time a task takes now if for whatever reason your team is taking an inordinate amount of time that is longer than 
what you think it should take, then then this is also a red flag, right? Uh, it could mean a lot of things, uh, very subjective. But if you see this happening in your team, um, you should take remedial action and figure out why simple tasks are taking an inordinate amount of time. It could be that people don't know about automation. It could be that they are not using tools properly. It could be anything. Um, it could be contextual, but but you should definitely address this. Um, and please avoid hiring anybody like a head of engineering or anything like that, right? Uh, now, many startups want to have uh, like this uh, notion that they want to project an outside image that we've got a head of engineering to kind of sort things out. And this is like a, um, a, like a jewel in the crown kind of a thing. Uh, so people think that hiring a head of engineering is now a good signal to the outside world. Uh, and I'll be able to impress people, raise money and all that. No, it doesn't help. It doesn't do anything. So you're better off avoiding bringing anybody like, like a head of engineering or a VP of engineering into your early stage startup. Um, even if people tell you to do so, even if investors tell you to do so. So this is also a sign of bad investors, which I'll address uh, right away, right? Uh, uh, I won't say bad, but maybe not favorable investors. If an investor is coming to you and asking, uh, do you have head of engineering in your team? You should avoid this investor, right? At an early stage startup, it doesn't really matter. Your, your, your founders are heads of engineering for all practical purposes. And like I said, you guys are writing code, talking to customers and grooming your team. Uh, you don't really need an outside person to do this. Um, also, uh, like, again, it's a function of, this is why it all boils down to like, you should, you should hire people you know. Um, avoid these uh, weekly meetings or where people are just submitting status, blabbering about what they're doing. It doesn't really help. Um, you should rather have what I call as brainstorming sessions where you're only asking people to talk about problems or mistakes that they've made, okay? Uh, this is gonna serve uh, two purposes. One, um, it will bring out the introverts in us to talk about what mistakes we make. Um, and it will also serve as a learning for others in the team. Like, uh, okay, people will now think, okay, if one person opens up about their mistakes, then it is like not so bad for others to open up as well. Um, it really helps. And you do it on a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, monthly basis, doesn't really matter. Do it in person on, the, on Zoom or on Zoho, doesn't really matter. But I think you should definitely do this. Rather than just having a meeting where people are talking about statuses, uh, what they've done, uh, you should just have a brainstorming of uh, what, what has gone wrong, what people want to learn, and what mistakes they've made. Okay. Any questions on this? Okay, um, yeah, I've, I've already talked about these things, so I'll just reiterate this. Uh, please hire engineers who are thirsty to learn. Uh, this is paramount. And most of these guys will be able to work without supervision. Uh, so for example, at Epic One, I hired a guy uh, who was from Kolkata, who was just out of college. And uh, he turned out to be great. Uh, some of the proxies that I used in hiring were very simple, right? Uh, I tested during the interview process uh, what, how, how, how good he is at tackling unfamiliar territories. Okay, uh, that was one one proxy, and also how easy it is to communicate with people. So uh, many people like they talk a lot, but you can't really understand what has been said. You can't get the gist of it. Uh, so even after they have spoken for 20 minutes, you're wondering what did they say? So even if this person is super talented, it doesn't really matter if you can't understand what he or she is communicating to you. So it's really important to kind of figure out whether both of you can communicate well in a short span of time. Um, and this was another proxy that I used. And quite honestly, I didn't use any other like, you know, uh, lead code or any of the other testing methodologies that, that big companies use. 
I made sure that he is reasonably he or reasonably good at coding and he can work without supervision. And this guy turned out to be a great hire, and and he accomplished like nearly what two or three engineers would accomplish uh, in in a short span of time. And of course, you should give them freedom and leverage in tech choices, right? I mean, you can't be dictating choices all the time. Uh, it, it again, it it all this all goes hand in hand. People who work without supervision, people who don't need micromanagement, typically want to be left uh, to make their choices. And if you put a bunch of these people together, collectively they will come with choices that work well for everyone. There will be some conflict. There will be uh, there will be there will be fights. There will be issues, but that's okay. Uh, you will definitely come up with the collective choice that is better, uh, and without you spending any time or energy on this, right? As a founder. So, like I said, this 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 dude, like uh, uh, I was going with the notion that we had to do everything in Flask. Flask is a Python web framework. But he came and said, "Listen, I mean, Flask is not so fast. Let's do this benchmarking with Fast API. This is a new emerging infra technology within Python. Um, so let's try it out." And we tried it out. It was great, and we just went with it. Right now, see, I mean, I I, I mentioned at some time back that you should not go into fancier technologies uh, right away. But here, it's a fancier technology within an ecosystem that everybody is familiar with. It's within Python. It's already well supported. There are so many GitHub stars on Fast API. You'll be shocked how they got like so many GitHub stars and so many forks within like a six month time uh, time span. And people at Microsoft have endorsed it. So so I mean, you use these proxy signals to figure out what technology to go after, and then and then make those choices, right? And I know uh, somebody raised the question of um, paying uh, paying startup engineers, right? All of your resource constrained, but this is one aspect that is out of your hands, unfortunately. And it, it's a very competitive market, uh, and you have to pay engineers well. You, without paying them well, people will just not come and work with you unless they are in your, like I said, in your first circle of friends, cousins, or you know, siblings who are willing to kind of work with you at, for for lesser pay, right? But for that, you and and I somehow believe that. You have to pay people well, even if they are within your uh, within your known circle, right? Uh, primarily because you want to offload a lot of their other um, uh, what should I say issues in life. You don't want people to be thinking about oh, you know, whether will I be able to buy a house tomorrow? Whether will I be able to sustain myself tomorrow? If something goes wrong, what should I do? You should offload off those thoughts from your from your teams. Head and one way to do that is to pay them well. Uh, all of us don't have this luxury, uh, but unfortunately, we have to deal with this. And and what I would do is I would probably look at why we are not able to pay engineers well, and it will most likely fall back to one of the issues where you are still a vitamin and not a painkiller. Uh, so, yeah, this is this is one proxy to your start, figuring out your startup success as well. Hey, Pradeep, quick quick time check. We have uh, less than ten minutes left. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, and help them in debugging. Um, that's that's a known thing. Um, somebody asked about UX and UI, so I'll quickly touch upon that. Uh, so you should show something to your customer as soon as possible, rather than just talking about in theory, right? And you should prototype really fast, ideally in less than a week. Um, and you should build analytics hooks into your prototype. This is a part of figuring out your customer needs, what customers are actually looking for in your product. Uh, when I say uh, analytics hooks, uh, I'm talking of Google Analytics hooks, which will tell you how the product is being used, uh, rather than what. Uh, this gives you a fundamental look into how customers are using and whether they are using the features that are pain points or whether they are using features that are nice to have. Okay, um, and by doing this, you are now avoiding asking obvious questions to your customers, which can be a, uh, you know, it, it, it's a turn off, right? And please incorporate crash reporting tools. Uh, pretty much every, uh, I don't know how to do it in cybersecurity. I don't know if this is applicable to you, but if you have consumers or if you have uh, uh, enterprises who are uh, in, uh, facing product crashes, that's not a good thing, right? 
and uh, fix bugs iterate and release fast this is this is paramount rather than waiting on three month four month releases just do a weekly release or a bi weekly release and just keep releasing fast okay. uh you should while ui is super important uh, you should definitely avoid heavy emphasis on design um and i'll tell you a simple way to do this uh, there is a tool called adobe xd i don't know how many of you have come across this tool it's a very simple tool it is free to use and the learning curve is not at all high so you can start off using this even as an engineer because it's all grid based like bootstrap so if you want to get started with design um you should definitely do go check out play around with adobe xd and build a build a few simple designs it's very easy to build low very very uh, very easy to learn and moreover it's free of cost there is absolutely no money you have to spend to start off with okay and you should always use bootstrap ui elements if you are building any kind of web interface to your product right please stay away from any other fancy design um mechanisms that people talk to you or you come across uh, just having simple functional design uh, using bootstrap ui elements and using adobe xd solves 99% of your design problems okay don't spend time on any logo design it's not at all important uh, people forget logos every company has changed their logo a gazillion times it doesn't matter please don't spend any time on this and don't hire any designers designers are extremely expensive by the time you communicate your idea to the designer you've already lost time by the time that designer communicates that idea to your team time has been lost and designers take an awful amount of time to build with right they i mean there are again exceptions it's very hard to find these exceptional designers because we don't work in the design community i mean we are all engineers we are not designers so you are better off in your team picking up X, adobe xd spending some time online learning resources and and doing something really fast and building a reasonably good ui okay um like there are these uh, design screen prototypes which will just show the product flow this is what designers will give you as one of their end products and these are like really useless right and everybody uh, on on this planet earth already knows about these design screen prototypes just just avoid these and you can use xd and other tools and build a working prototype like in 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 bootstrap and in javascript very fast so you don't really uh need to spend time on this screen iteration just by using design elements okay um number one rule in selling show the present sell the future right you are not selling the present just because you have built something that is not what you are selling you are you have built something and you are you are showing this so that the customer gets an idea of what you are capable of or what your team is capable of or what your startup is going to do you are always selling the future so please keep this in mind if you are feeling that your sales are not going anywhere uh, this could be number one reason and this is less uh, uh, less science more art and there are i mean i mean there are no proven ways of doing this but if anybody has some specific questions around this i'm happy to do a one on one and take it forward um cold calls and emails do work so like i said please don't hesitate from cold calling cold emailing like i blindly reached out to the cto of audi in germany uh, on linkedin with like a three sentence introduction and what i wanted to do and he responded and he said sure we'll he, he'll take us up on 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 this on this uh, offer or whatever we wanted him to um, go after right so it is very much possible so don't hesitate from cold calling or emailing and please don't do incessant follow ups um if you hear if you don't hear from somebody after one or two nudges you should take that as a no that this person is not interested in talking to you right and we should learn to take no with a stride i think this is all of you know uh, very well and excel is a best sales tool if you want if you are 
thinking of using anything other than excel again it's a waste of time and effort so raising money uh, when to ra when to raise right you are better off raising money when you have leverage on your side okay so what is this leverage that you have the only leverage that works across stages is growth okay so if you have insane growth you will get money no questions asked uh, and you will get money from multiple investors and this gives you leverage to choose from which investors you want to take money from you don't want to take money from all investors not all investors are the same you already have done your homework you know which are the investors you want to go after so so you you choose right um the other leverage that you that works is founder credentials right especially in some niche field like cyber security or like protein synthesis um or genome sequencing um or any any of these like like quantum mechanics for example the founder credentials really work if you are a phd from iic um if you are a phd from stanford who has spent like 4 5 years into this niche uh, uh technology that that hardly like you know nobody ever has heard of you can raise money now doesn't mean you'll become a billion dollar startup you can definitely raise money based on these credentials it works it's a leverage on your side um and of course you should be able to choose investors right like i said you should be able to say i want to take money from bloom i don't want to take money from someone else uh, even if that guy offers me money some real estate dude who has made a ton of money who wants to invest in your startup you can say no to them uh what are the signs of no typically nobody will say no to you when you're raising money okay uh the number one sign says we need to see more growth um this is definitely somebody who does not intend to give you money okay so you can disregard this a lot of times you'll find uh people come back to you and say oh you know you're raising half a million it's too small for our fund we won't invest at this stage there is no money that is too small for any fund even sequoia gives out half a million dollar checks so if you hear this which means it's a no uh you need to expand your team i think i, I wrote this uh, in in the previous slides also uh no you don't need to expand your team um uh, this is again a sign that this guy has no intention of giving you money and meetings don't end so you have meeting one meeting one will be followed by meeting two meeting two will be followed by meeting three four five six you will just have meetings which, which will have no end and you will just discuss repeated things in this in the in the meetings you will just dis discuss the same things and come back please don't do this this is they are just the uh, investors like to be involved in startups right um, without giving money so you should actively try to avoid all these unnecessary meetings and like i said repeated questions you will hear the same questions in every meeting that's again a sign that this guy has no no intention to give you money okay so that's it have gone 3 minutes past i think um so some of the thoughts are always build sell and listen to customers um be very receptive to signs of a no take it in stride um whether it is customer not returning calls product you said slipping um and as far as possible uh try to avoid being perfect right um i i know that we all want to be steve jobs but in an early stage startup you are better off like giving something out which is not so polished and getting feedback and iterating on that rather than striving for perfection okay that's it um you can reach me on my email or on my twitter handle uh please feel free to reach any time i do try to tend to respond to emails within like an hour or two um so that's my usual response time that's it so thank you everyone i hope this was useful and uh look forward to interacting with you guys in the future fantastic so thank you uh, let's all uh, thank pradeep manavara i think uh, this was a fantastic session covered a lot of breadth and had so many nuggets of a uh, very concrete wisdom across team building across building a product back end front end technology stack raising money sales 
So um, this is, I think, very different from the previous sessions, and is going to be very unique that way. So thank you very much again, Pradeep, for uh, taking the time, the effort. Sure. And like Anytime. always, uh, like always, uh, the founders are uh, welcome to uh, reach out to you know to the mentors uh, if if they are willing. Um, and if you have any specific aspects that you would like to reach out to specific mentors, do let us know. We won't we, we won't promise, but we'll definitely try to make it happen. Right. So okay, uh, let's. I, I think that's all the time we had today. Um, and hopefully there are no other final questions. And if there are, then let's uh, take it up uh, offline. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you spending nearly two hours on a Sunday morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pradeep. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pradeep. Thanks, Thank you, Pradeep. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. 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 Thank